Hi guys, welcome to my study compass. In this video, I'll be walking you through the past paper, Math P2, Variant 1, May June 2017. Let's get started. Simplify. X raised to the power 2 all raised to the power 5. So by applying one of the rules of indices, we multiply the powers and so we get x raised to the power 2 times 5 and that leaves us with x raised to the power 10. The thickness of one sheet of paper is 8 times 10 raised to the power negative 3 centimeters. Work out the thickness of 250 sheets of paper. So to find the thickness of 250 sheets of paper, we multiply 250 times the thickness of one sheet of paper, which is 8 times 10 raised to the power negative 3 centimeters. By typing this into the calculator, we get 2 centimeters. Write 23.4571 correct to 4 significant figures. So from the left, we count 4 numbers. And the next number after the fourth number is 7. And since 7 is 5 or more, we add 1 to the number 5 and we are left with 23.46. Write 23.4571 correct to the nearest 10. So first off, we mark the digits in the 10s column. And in this case, that digit is 2. The number next to 2 is 3, and since 3 is less than 5, we leave 2 as it is and replace 3 with 0. And so, by correcting 23.4571 to the nearest 10, we have 20. The table shows the temperatures in 5 places at 10 a.m. one day in January. Which place was the coldest? So the coldest place is the place with the lowest temperature. And by looking at the temperature values, the lowest temperature is negative 10. And the place with this temperature is Chicago. At 2 p.m., the temperature in Helsinki had increased by 4 degrees Celsius. Write down the temperature in Helsinki at 2 p.m. So to find the temperature in Helsinki at 2 p.m., we add 4 degrees Celsius to the previous temperature, which is negative 7 degrees Celsius. And this leaves us with a value of negative 3 degrees Celsius. Factorize completely. 12n squared minus 4mn. So this is pretty straightforward. The common factor in this case is 4n. And when we factor that out, we are left with 3n minus m. And so we have 4n into brackets 3n minus m. 2 raised to the power r is equal to 1 over 16. Find the value of r. So to find the value of r, we will try to rewrite 1 over 16 as a base of r. And 1 over 16 becomes 1 over 2 raised to the power 4. 1 over 2 raised to the power 4 can be rewritten as 2 raised to the power negative 4. And so since the bases are equal, it means that the value of r is equal to negative 4. 3 raised to the power t is equal to the fifth square root of 3. Find the value of t. Let's rewrite 5 square root 3 as a base of 3. And that gives us 3 raised to the power 1 over 5. And so since the bases are equal, we have t equals 1 over 5. Without using a calculator, work out one whole number 2 over 3 plus 5 over 7. Write down all the steps of your working and give your answer as a mixed number in its simplest form. So the first step is to write the mixed fraction as an improper fraction. So one whole number 2 over 3 as an improper fraction becomes 5 over 3. So we now have 5 over 3 plus 5 over 7. The LCM of 3 and 7 is 21. So 3 goes into 21 7 times and we multiply that by the numerator which is 5 plus 7 goes into 21 3 times and we multiply 3 by the numerator which is 5. And so this gives us 50 over 21. We can convert 50 over 21 into a mixed fraction and that gives us 2 whole number 8 over 21. Simon has two boxes of cards. In one box, each card has one shape drawn on it. That is either a triangle or a square. In the other box, each card is colored either red or blue. 
Simon picks a card from each box at random. The probability of picking a triangle card is T. The probability of picking a red card is R. Complete the table for the cards that Simon picks, writing each probability in terms of R and T. So in the question, we've already been given the probability that Simon picks square and red. And the probability that he picks square is given as 1 minus T multiplied by the probability that he picks red, which is R. So we have 1 minus T times R. So we are asked to find the probability that Simon picks triangle and red. And that gives us T times R, which is TR. The next thing we are asked to find is that Simon picks triangle and blue. The probability that he picks triangle is T. And the probability that he picks blue will be 1 minus R. So we have T times 1 minus R. In the third event, we are asked to find the probability that Simon picks square and blue. The probability that he picks square is 1 minus t and the probability that he picks blue is 1 minus r. So we have 1 minus t times 1 minus r. H is directly proportional to the square root of P. H is equal to 5.4 when P is equal to 1.44. Find H when P is equal to 2.89. So in the mathematical terms, we rewrite h is directly proportional to the square root of p. And that means that h is equal to a constant, which we will call k, multiplied by the square root of p. The next step is to find the value of k. And to find the value of k, we slot in the values of h and p that have been given in the question, which is when h is equal to 5.4, p is equal to 1.44. So by slotting these values into the equation that we have, we we get k equals 4.5. So we now have h is equal to 4.5 times the square root of p. So when the value of p is equal to 2.89, we slot that into the equation that we have and we get the value of h as 7.65. By shading the unwanted regions of the grid, find and label the region R that satisfies the following four inequalities y is less than or equal to 2, y is greater than or equal to 1, y is less than or equal to 2x minus 1, y is less than or equal to 5 minus x. So to answer this question, we first need to draw the lines for these inequalities. So for the first inequality, y is less than or equal to 2, we draw the line y is equal to 2. So for the next inequality, we'll draw the line y is equal to 1. For the next inequality, we'll draw the line y is equal to 2x minus 1. And for the last inequality, we'll draw the line y is equal to 5 minus x. And because all these inequalities have the equal sign in addition to the less than or greater than symbol, all these lines will be solid straight lines. So notice that each of these lines split the graph into two main regions. So by using the given inequalities as a guide, we are going to determine and shade all the unwanted regions. So the first inequality is y is less than or equal to 2. So let's pick a random point on the graph as a test point. So let's pick the origin. And so the origin has the y coordinate to be 0. And so when we slot in, zero into the inequality we have zero is less than or equal to two and that statement is true and so that means that the region below the line y is equal to two satisfies the inequality therefore it is a wanted region so we will shade the region above y is equal to two because that is unwanted the next inequality is y is greater than or equal to one let's pick the origin as a test point when you put 0 in the inequality, we have 0 is greater than or equal to 1. And that statement is false, which means that the region below y is equal to 1 does not satisfy the inequality. And so we will shade that region. The next inequality is y is less than or equal to 2x minus 1. So let's use the origin as a test point. So when we slot in, 0 is less than or equal to 2 times 0 minus 1. We have 0 is less than or equal to minus 1, which is false. And so it means that all the region above the line y is equal to 2x minus 1 does not satisfy the inequality. And so we will shade that region. 
The final inequality is y is less than or equal to 5 minus x. Let's use the origin as a test point, and that gives us 0 is less than or equal to 5 minus 0, and that simplifies to 0 is less than or equal to 5. 0 is less than or equal to 5 is a true statement, and so that means that the region below y is equal to 5 minus x satisfies the inequality, and so we will rather shade the region above y is equal to 5 minus x. And after shading all these unwanted regions, we are now left with a region that satisfies all four inequalities, and we will label this region as R. The two barrels in the diagram are mathematically similar. The smaller barrel has a height of 8 cm and a capacity of 100 liters. The larger barrel has a height of 90 cm and a capacity of 160 liters. Work out the value of H. So first off, let's set up our ratio. The linear scale factor of the small barrel to the big barrel has been given as h is to 90 centimeters. And we've also been given the capacity or the volume of the small and the big barrel. And so this means that we need to cube the linear scale factor and this gives us h cubed is to 90 cubed. And so based on this, we will set up our new equation. And by making h the subject, we get 90 cubed over 160 times 100 all raised to the power 1 over 3 centimeters. And by typing this into the calculator, we get h is equal to 76.9 centimeters. A line has gradient 5. M and N are two points on this line. M is the point X8 and N is the point K23. Find an expression for X in terms of K. So we know that the slope of a line or the gradient of a line is the change in Y over the change in X. And that is the same as Y2 minus Y1 over X2 minus X1. Since we've been given the gradient of the line as 5, we now have 5 is equal to 23 minus 8 over k minus x. And that simplifies to x is equal to k minus 3. The diagram shows a cuboid a, b, c, d, e, f, g, h. a, e is equal to 5 centimeters, e, h is equal to 4 centimeters, and a, g is equal to 13 centimeters. Calculate the angle between the line AG and the base EFGH of the cuboid. The angle we are to find has been indicated on the diagram. And so based on this illustration, we can see that we need to apply Sokatwa to find the value of the angle, which has been labeled as alpha. So now we have sine alpha is equal to AE over AG. So alpha will now be equal to the sine inverse of AE over AG. And we know that AE is 5 and AG is 13. And so by typing this into the calculator, we get alpha as 22.6 degrees, correct to one decimal place. The diagram shows a regular octagon joined to an equilateral triangle. Work out the value of X. So to find X, we know that all angles formed around a vertex equals 360 degrees. And we know that each angle in an equilateral triangle is equal to 60 degrees. And each angle in a regular polygon, in this case, we have an octagon, is equal. However, we do not know the value of each angle in the octagon. And so we are going to call this value alpha. And so that gives us the equation x plus 60 degrees plus alpha is equal to 360 degrees. To find the value of x, we first need to find the value of alpha. Since the value of alpha has not been directly given in the question, we have to find a way to get this value. We know for a fact that the sum of all interior angles in a polygon is equal to 180 degrees times n minus 2, where n is the number of sides of the polygon. In this case, we have an octagon, and so n is equal to 8. 
since we have a regular octagon and all angles in this octagon are equal we know that the sum of all the interior angles in the octagon is equal to 8 times alpha and by simplifying this equation we have alpha is equal to 135 degrees and so we go back and slot the value of alpha back into our previous equation and that gives us our value of x as 165 degrees. The diagram shows information about the first 100 seconds of a car journey. Calculate the acceleration during the first 20 seconds of the journey. So the acceleration in the first 20 seconds of the journey will be equal to the final speed, which is 16, minus the initial speed, which is 0 meters per second, divided by 20 minus 0 seconds. And that gives us an acceleration of 0 0.8 meters per second squared. Work out the total distance traveled by the car in the 100 seconds. And so we know for a fact that whenever we are given a speed time graph and we are asked to find the distance traveled, the distance traveled is equal to the area under the graph. And since we are finding the distance traveled for the entire 100 seconds journey, the total distance traveled will be the area of the graph from t is equal to 0 to t is equal to 100. In this case, the area under the graph is a very complex shape, but we can split it up into basic shapes to enable us to find the total distance traveled. So by splitting the area under the graph up, we have A1, A2, and A3, where A1 is the area of a triangle, A2 is the area of a trapezium, and A3 is the area of a rectangle. And so by slotting in the values from the graph, and simplifying the equation, we get the total distance traveled as 1,180 meters. Six students revise for a test. The scatter diagram shows the time in hours each student spent revising and their mark in the test. The data for two more students is shown in the table. Plot these two points on the scatter diagram. So let's plot the first point by locating 4.5 on the time axis and 33 on the mark axis. Let's now plot the second point by locating 6.5 on the time axis and 35 on the mark axis. What type of correlation is shown on the scatter diagram? On the scatter diagram, we can see that a general increase in the time results in a general increase in the marks. And so this means that we have a positive correlation. Draw a line of best fit on the scatter diagram. The general rule of thumb in drawing a line of best fit is to ensure that you draw the line through the maximum number of points while balancing an equal number of points above and below the line. Another student spent 5.5 hours revising. Estimate a mark for this student. So we locate 5.5 on the time axis and try to use our line of best fit to estimate the mark this student would have. And so by doing this, we get an estimated mark of 36. In this Venn diagram, shade the region F union G prime. So let's say F represents the set of people who like to play football and G represents the set of people who like to play golf. And so F union G prime can be interpreted in our own terms as the set of people who play football or who don't play golf. And so first off, we will shade the region indicating the set of people who play football. And after that, we also shade the set of people who do not play golf. A universal set contains 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. The elements in set A is such that each element is an odd number. The elements in set B is such that each element is a square number. And the elements in set C is such that each element is a multiple of 3. Write all the elements of the universal set E in the Venn diagram below. 
And so to fill in the Venn diagram, we first of need to locate the elements that are common to A and B. And in this case, that element is 1. The element common to A and C is 3. The element common to B and C is null. There is no element common to B and C, so we leave it empty. The element common to A, B, and C is 9. So after filling that in, we now fill in the rest of the elements in set A, which are 7 and 5. The rest of the elements in set C is 6, and the remaining element in set B is 4. The elements that are neither in set A, B, and C, but are still in the universal set are 2. 2 and 8. Another number is included in the set E. This number is in the region A prime intersection B intersection C. Write down a possible value for this number. So understanding the descriptions for the elements in set A, B, and C, we are told to write any possible number that is not an odd number. And at the same time, that number is a square number. And the number also needs to be a multiple of 3. And so any number that satisfies all these criteria is what we are supposed to write and one of these possibilities is 36. The diagram shows a parallelogram OCEG. O is the origin. OA is equal to A and OB is equal to B. BHF and AHD are straight lines parallel to the sides of the parallelogram. OG is equal to 3 times OA and OC is equal to 2 times OB. Write the vector HE in terms of A and B. So the vector HE is equal to HD plus DE and we know that HD is the same as B and DE is the same as 2A. And so in terms of A and B, we now have HE equals B plus 2A. Complete this statement. A plus 2B is the position vector of point dash. To find this position vector, it means that we need to start from the origin. So from the origin, let's move in the A direction. Then let's move twice in the B direction. We land at point D. And so we put D in the space provided. Write down two vectors that can be written as 3A minus B. One of these vectors is CF because if you start at point C and move three times in the A direction and move in the negative B direction, you land on F. And so we have CF as the first vector that can be written as 3A minus B. The second vector is BG. When you stand at B and move three times in the A direction and in the negative B direction, you land at G. And so the second vector that can be written as 3a minus b is bg. ABCD is a rhombus with side length 10 centimeters. Angle ADC is equal to 40 degrees. DAC is a sector of a circle with center D. Calculate the shaded area. Since we are dealing with a rhombus, it means AD is equal to DC is equal to CB is equal to BA and all of these are each 10 centimeters. And since we are dealing with a rhombus, if angle ADC is equal to 40 degrees, it means that angle ABC is also equal to 40 degrees. We've also seen an indication of half of the shaded region being labeled as A1. And to find the area of A1, that will be the area of the sector ADC minus the triangle ADC. And since the sectors and triangles on both sides are the same, this means that the area of the shaded region is equal to 2 times A1, where A1 is equal to the area of sector ADC or ABC minus the area of triangle ADC or ABC. So to find the area of the sector ADC, we have 40 degrees over 360 degrees times pi r squared, which r is equal to 10. And that simplifies to the area of the sector ADC as 100 over 9 pi centimeters squared. And the area of triangle ADC is equal to half times 10 times 10 times sine 40 degrees centimeters squared. And this simplifies as 
50 sine 40 degrees centimeters squared and so when we slot these values into our previous equation we now have the area of the shaded region as 2 times into bracket 100 over 9 pi minus 50 sine 40 degrees centimeters squared and when we type this into the calculator we now have 5.53 centimeters squared correct to three significant figures the diagram shows a first spinner. Anna spins it twice and adds the scores. Complete the table. And so in the table, we are to add the score on the first spin to the score on the second spin. And so that's pretty straightforward. Write down the most likely total score. The most likely total score is the same as the most recurring total score, and that score is 7. Find the probability that Anna scores a total less than 6. So the probability that Anna scores a total less than 6 is equal to the number of scores less than 6 divided by the total number of scores. So the number of scores less than 6 is equal to 7 and the total number of scores is equal to 25. And so we have a probability of 7 over 25. Find the probability that Anna scores a total of 3. And so that probability is equal to the number of scores equal to 3 divided by the total number of scores. And the number of scores equal to 3 is 0. So we have 0 divided by 25 which is equal to 0. A, B, C, and D are points on the circle. A, D is parallel to B, C. The chords A, C, and B, D intersect at X. Find the value of U and the value of V. Finding angle U is pretty straightforward because we know that chord D, C subtends an angle U degrees on one point on the circumference of the circle and subtends another angle 35 degrees at another point on the circumference of the circle and so that means that u is equal to 35 degrees to find the value of v we first need to take note of two things the first is that since ad and bc are parallel lines this means that angle adb and angle u are alternate angles and alternate angles are equal and so adb is also equal to 35 degrees the second thing we need to take into consideration is the fact that all angles in a triangle add up to 180 degrees and so this means that to find the value of V, that will be 180 degrees minus 2 times 35 degrees. And that gives us the value of V as 110 degrees. F, G, and H are points on the circle center O. Find the value of P. To find the value of P, we need to take note of two things. The first is that the angle subtended by chord FG at the center of the circle is twice the angle it subtends on the circumference of the circle, which is P. And so this means that P is equal to angle FOG divided by 2. We have not been given angle FOG directly in the diagram or in the question, but it is easy to find the value of the angle FOG because we know that all angles formed around a point is equal to 360 degrees and so this means that angle FOG is equal to 360 degrees minus 210 degrees and that is equal to 150 degrees and so when we slot this value of angle FOG inside the equation we have for P we get the value of P as 75 degrees Write as a single fraction in its simplest form, x squared minus 3x over x squared minus 9. For the numerator, when we factor out x, we are left with x minus 3. And for the denominator, we recognize that as the difference of two squares, and that can be rewritten as x squared minus 3 squared. And so in the next step, we rewrite the difference of two squares, which is x squared minus 3 squared as x plus 3, x minus 3. And so the x minus 3 cancels out in the numerator and the denominator, and we are left with 
x over x plus 3. Write as a single fraction in its simplest form 3 over x minus 4 plus 2 over 2x plus 5. So the LCM in this case will be x minus 4 times 2x plus 5. So x minus 4 goes into the LCM and is left with 2x plus 5 and so that multiplies the numerator which is 3. 2x plus 5 goes into the LCM and we are left with x minus 4 and x minus 4 multiplies the numerator which is 2. In the next step when we simplify the numerator we get 6x plus 15 plus 2x minus 8 and that further simplifies in the next step as 8x plus 7. So for the final answer we have 8x plus 7 divided by x minus 4 2x plus 5 or you can choose to simplify the denominator and leave it as 2x squared minus 3x minus 20. Thank you for watching. I hope you found this video useful. See you in the next video. Bye guys.